Excitement. I'm no I'm no Swifty. But um I am I do like the Jets. Well, I like the Chiefs too, but I just kinda like football for the characters. Are you that kind of a person? Do you actually like football? Uh, can't imagine watching football just for football. For me it's the characters, you know, Patrick Mahomes, Travis Kelsey, Zach Wilson, all these people. Interesting characters. Welcome back to the channel um, and to your public speaking online class. This is lecture three in David Lloyd's book, The World is Made of Stories. And thinking about the football game or any football game or any sports game is a great way to think about how stories really do constitute why sports matter so much. Why do these people get paid millions of dollars? Because there's a story that they uphold or a story that we tell about them. That makes sense to us. It gives us great value. The story of people overcoming great odds or working on themselves to become extremely talented or being the best possible athlete in their uh, sport and all this kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, the, um, the importance of narrative and story. Wait a second, my lighting is not the best today. Maybe I'm just not the best today. I don't know. A sad, it's a sad man who who blames his lighting, who blames his tools for what he sees. No, but anyway, st um, the story of sports might be something worth talking about in one of your many, many speeches that you'll do for this class. So this is lecture three. Let's get right into it. Uh, first of all, of course, obligatory, obligatory announcement. Please. Join us on Discord and talk about these talks. Tell us what you think. I'm happy to chat with you here. Happy to chat with you anywhere. Very few people e email me. The people in my in-person class, this is actually really funny, the people in my in-person class, they've emailed me more about like, what are we doing? When is this due? How do I do it? And I'm talking to them every class about this. And they're like, I don't know what to do. And you guys are, you online people are silent. So this is a weird semester for me. My in-person class doesn't talk. My online class doesn't talk. But my in-person class talks about not knowing what to do, even though every single class is about what to do. And then you guys are quiet about this other stuff. But I would think in the online class you'd be more willing to chat. I mean, there are a few of you in Discord who do chat. And that's very, very good. And I like that. But uh, maybe more of you could join in. Come on in. The water's fine. Come on. Water's fine. Come on in. Come on in. Get over here! You guys playing Mortal Kombat? I haven't played the new one yet. All right, so I wanted to start here. This is about where we left off last time, about halfway through the book. We'd rather have a story about nothingness and meaningless than to have no story. So it is kind of a story. Nihilism is kind of a story. A story about how nothing matters... We're powerless. There's no point in engaging. So this is also a story. So people who advocate a kind of a nihilist position on certain things, you might have friends like that. Uh, they really are, you are able to respond to them by saying, no, that's just the narrative that you're putting together. So ironically, it is very meaningful to advance this nihilist perspective. It's meaningful to them to create a story where we're powerless and we don't have any abilities to fix anything. Now he takes a um, a very kind of harsh view of religion here, oddly, since he's a Buddhist, and that's, kind of, that's a religion too. In medieval Europe, a god story was reinforced by the church and state. In the 17th century, men killed each other in, in mass because they could no longer agree on its details. It says, neither side could eliminate the other. That argument eventually yielded to more secular stories involving absolute monarchs, capitalism, and scientific control 
or with the conditions of our existence. I don't know about this gloss, but the point is a pretty good one, which is uh, for people who say religion is a story and science is the truth, they're really saying that one story is preferred to them over another. Now, there are serious consequences to what story we decide to advocate and believe as being true for everyone. Very serious consequences to this. The narrative that you tell yourself about your role in the world has, and we know this, right? Mental illness, depression, anxiety, imposter syndrome. We know all this to be true, don't we? You've probably experienced this yourself. I mean, there's not anybody who hasn't been touched by a bit of mental illness, I, I don't think. At least not you, your family, your friends. That story you tell yourself is helped by psychology, by therapy. They literally show you a new way to cast your story about the world. That's the role of therapy. So this, this gloss I'm not such a big fan of, but the point he's trying to make, he might have glossed it just to kind of like slap you across the face and say, look, all these things are tales that didn't hold up. And then some of them, um, we came up with different ones that were uh, better. In place of a few enforced pre-modern narratives today, we sink or swim in a tsunami of stories unleashed by freedom of the press and technologies of mass communication. How do all these stories compete, cooperate, evolve, infiltrate, and subvert each other? Does social order require a minimum defense to a common story? What stories are we willing to die for? That's a great question. What stories... Are we willing to die for? And there's a great reading from the London Review of Books that I often assign in my argumentation course. Yeah, I'll do a video on that reading. It's a wonderful, like, who am I um, supposed to kill is the name of the essay. I think Andrew Davies wrote it. He's a great writer, great journalist, great writer for, um, for the London Review of Books. But he also writes for other publications as well. Really great. And uh, in that, he talks about these narratives of how we're supposed to come together? How are we supposed to have politics today? And it's really kind of this question that Loy would say is a question of one story no longer holding water, no longer being able to carry what is necessary for life. There's a hole in the bucket, we could say. So a pretty interesting uh, piece. Maybe I'll do a video on that as well and add it to all the other videos that you've seen. Um, do you feel overwhelmed by media? How, do you, how long does it go? Here's a great question to ask yourself. How long does it take for you to look at a screen in the morning? So count up how many minutes between when you wake up and when you look at social media, a screen, a news feed, Twitter, email, whatever it is you look at, uh, at first. I would th think it's mostly seconds for you, right? Under 30 seconds or is that too high? Like what do you think? Slaves in the United States were usually not allowed to learn to read. Not usually allowed. That's very true. Neil Postman here, who's a great media professor at NYU, one of the most brilliant um, uh, American media scholars, I think, to ever live. This is one of my favorite quotes, so I think I'll read it to you. What Orwell feared were those who would ban books. What Huxley feared was there would be no reason to ban a book, so there'd be no one who wanted to read one. This is the conflict between two great dystopian books that you might have read. One is called Brave New World by Aldous Huxley, and the other is called 1984 by George Orwell. Have you read either one of those? I think those are great. Under the Trump presidency, people start talking about 1984 again because they thought that Donald Trump aligned very well with this idea of a totalitarian big brother kind of state. Ironically, since people who voted for Trump were saying they didn't want a totalitarian big brother state. So there was, that's direct clash disagreement there. They're saying this guy's going to solve it, this guy's going to create it. What Aldous Huxley said is that the way that social control would work is not through domination and repression, but through convincing you that you're doing the right thing by not being critical, not inquiring after things, not asking questions to the sources of information you get, and not pursuing different sources when you're, when your natural kind of feeling is that things aren't quite right with this information. All that would go away and you would just accept what was given to you. So how often do you check the sources on the news? If you get your news from Twitter, like many of you probably do, or X, I guess we're supposed to call it 
Xter or something or Twitex. I don't know what we're supposed to call it now. Uh, how often do you follow those sources up and look for um, corroborating evidence or what we might call concurrent opinion? That would be an opinion from someone who's unrelated to this other person, completely unrelated, and uh, they don't know them, they're not friends with them, but they're an expert too, and they come to the same conclusion as that expert. So the perfect sort of thing would be, the way I usually talk about it is, a scientist in China conducts an experiment, and as a result, a scientist in Canada conducts an experiment, same result. Now that's concurrent opinion. It doesn't mean it's true per se, but it means it's good enough the more times it's replicated like that, that we could then make decisions based on it, and those decisions would not be, um, they would, they would, we'd be able to predict what would happen. We'd get the result we wanted. And that's the, um, that's what that is. So um, Huxley feared there'd be no reason to ban a book. Orwell feared those who would deprive us of information. Huxley feared those who would give us so much that we'd reduce to passivity and egoism. That sounds familiar, right? Just scrolling through TikTok, scrolling through Instagram. Orwell feared the truth would be concealed from us. Huxley feared the truth would be drowned in a sea of irrelevance. Boy, that's true. That also reminds me of um, Henry David Thoreau's famous quote. Henry David Thoreau, who you know wrote Walden. He had a great quote about um, when the telegraph line was completed from London to, to Boston, or to New York perhaps, I forget where. They're like, wow, now we can have communication. Thoreau rightly understood that because it's there, people are going to want to use it. You don't build a giant transatlantic cable for telegraph information and not think, I want to use that every day. It's like when you get a new car, you just want to drive it around, decreasing its value. I know it doesn't make any logical sense, but it's new. You want to use it. Also, the argument that a lot of our founding fathers had about a standing army. We shouldn't have a professional army because then we're going to want to use it. And then we see Central America, Vietnam, Korea, Iraq, Afghanistan. A war that's that went on long before you were born and long after until you're you're kind of an adult now. And it just ended. And it might not be over yet. So Thoreau said about the telegraph line, oh, we're gonna have this amazing telegraph line, and the only thing that people might communicate is that Princess Adelaide had a cough this morning. And it's so prescient, right? Because that is the kind of news we get most of the time these days, isn't it? Some celebrity news of who Taylor Swift is dating. or not. We have all this great technology. This is what we use it for. I'm not saying it's not important to people because it does shape the narrative of their lives, but it's also dangerous because if you see a bunch of irrelevance in the media, then uh, totalitarians and oppressive regimes can hide in plain sight. They certainly can. I keep hitting the Discord key because I love Discord. Sorry about that. So they'll hide in plain sight. That's what Huxley's book is about, Brave New World. Orwell feared we become a captive culture. Huxley feared we become a trivial culture. Huxley feared that what we love will ruin us. So we have to be very, very careful about information and stories and make sure that we are telling a good story that has numerous points of concurrence as we put it together. If we want to call a type of people mentally ill, we need the evidence. We can't just say, oh, I feel like their lifestyle is bad. We need to have the evidence. We need the sources. We need the transparency. Or as kids would say today, we need the receipts. We need the receipts. Whose quote is this here? Alex Carey. Propaganda is to democracy as violence is to a dictatorship. William Blum. I don't know about that because I think propaganda is, is a lot more diffuse than that. And it's a lot. it's everywhere. And propaganda could be used for good purposes which is, I think, what people fear about public speaking is that um, the big debate is if I can get people to do something that is unquestionably good, but I would have to use propaganda to do it, should I do it? And this is the debate between teleology, the ends justify the means, and deontology. It doesn't matter how you get there. The method has to be absolutely ethical. And the deontologist often says things like, I'd rather a thousand people who are guilty go free than one innocent person to be jailed. And that's why people have a lot of frustration with our justice system in the United States. 
Propaganda is an official story is maintained by persuading people that is the correct one, or rather there's reality itself. I think that's a really good point. The um the best way to be persuasive is to just tell people, I'm not being persuasive, I'm describing nature. I'm describing what is true and natural. That's such a powerful way to argue and to be persuasive. A powerful way to get people to come to your side. A little bit crazy, but it works. People say, no, that's the natural order. Think about like free market capitalism. People say it's it's natural. There's no, there's no other uh, economic or order we could have. Okay, now that second part is a claim you could defend. But that first part is absolutely not the way to defend that. What you would have to do to be ethical here is go through other economic orderings and say, that is dispreferred to market capitalism. You would say market capitalism has all kinds of problems. I'm not denying that. I'm not denying that people are harmed by it. But let's look at it fairly in comparison to every other system. You can't just say something's natural and leave it at that. But people do that all the time. And, and if it's connected to the stories you think are true or the story of the natural that you buy into, then you're, you're, you're hooked unless you're a critical thinker, unless you're somebody who can go beyond and say, well, what's the, what's the story there? If you start to think of everything you hear as a story, you can start to think of counter narratives and ways into it. I think it's a very, very powerful tool. The story of history as the story, history of story. If the world is made of stories, then development is more important than the rise and fall of empires. A society's stories are conditioned by the technologies available to produce and reproduce them. An oral tradition preserves myths and fables, sometimes elaborated into epics. Kings employ bards to sing their praises and memorialize their exploits. Wow. I wonder if this still goes on today. I guess this happens on YouTube now. There's YouTubers who will go over and over and over a politician's point of view and try to prove it to be. But do they sing their exploits? I'm trying to think of. Um, there are bards today, but they're kind of, I guess maybe so, Jason Aldean and um, Small Town song. And maybe the guy who did the Richmond, North of Richmond, but that's not in praise of anybody. But it is kind of bard-like, right? Fiction provides a way to learn from the life choices of others. God, that's true. Laboratories for moral experimentation. This is why uh, totalitarian people and oppressive people want to ban books. Because they understand that um, it turns things into choices that they don't want to be choices. And they make things moral experimentation to determine what your morals are when they're like, I've already figured out where the morals should be. These are people who believe that the moral order is best top down and people shouldn't experiment. They shouldn't figure out why a moral code is a moral code. They want to repress that. That's why we see so many book bannings now. But as, as was reported in, I think, The New Yorker, only 11 people nationally uh, are doing these book bans. There's only 11 people who are forcing these things, forcing governments to do that. That's wild to me. It's so crazy. Only 11 people are responsible for some incredibly large amount of book bans. But, like, why ban a book? Why ban a book? Think about that. Why are certain stories not for children? What's the story of childhood? What's the story of what children need? How does that influence it? We prefer the orientation of moral code, even when we don't follow it, to the disorientation of life without one. It's much easier to say, oh, I'm this uh, amazing Christian person, vote for me, put me in the House of Representatives, I believe in God, I believe in the Protestant story of Jesus Christ, and blah, blah, blah. Oh, and, uh, you know, I was doing some uh, pretty pretty unchristian-like things with my boyfriend in the theater, and in full display of the public, but that's okay, because I can ask for forgiveness. So that story, that Christian story of forgiveness is a really powerful one. Because um, people identify with that. They're like, well, I'm a sinner too. But I can ask for forgiveness, just like certain uh, Congress people from Colorado can. And I think that um, that behavior is, is like, well, I'm weak. I'm, I'm a human being, but I believe in God, and I know I made mistakes. This kind of forgiveness, I think, is a, is a much more, even though you can't follow the moral code, it's a much more powerful way to orient yourself in the world than just saying, anything goes. 
Because if you say anything goes, then there's no like, um, you have to directly defend your actions, uh, each one on your own, um, why it was a good thing to do and why it was okay to upset and hurt people. If you can just toss it to, uh, I'm imperfect, that's a great narrative, very powerful narrative. Let's go a little bit further down here. Oh, Lord of the Rings. Tolkien's Frodo cannot use the ring because it would use him to fight against power using the same means as power calling forth power. That's a powerful narrative that we like, right? War does not determine who is right, only who is left. That's why no one wins a war and how the Nazis won World War II. What? We'd have to go and look at that because I don't think that they did. We'd have to go and look at what he means there. That's kind of a crazy one. Maybe he means the ideology is still with us, the anti-Semitic master race purification ideology. Like if we could just get rid of all of these dirty people, our society would be great. If we could just get rid of all of these inhuman people, our society would be great. Those are the kind of things that are the Nazi ideology, genocidal ideology, facet, fascist ideology. Is that there's a group of people who are too impure to uh, be allowed to live or to be allowed to exist. Um, obviously an ideology that's horrific, but it's still around. Just open up the newspaper, New York Times, Newsday, New York Post. Just open it up. You'll see plenty of anti-Semitism to go around. Maybe that's what he means. I don't know. We'd have to go look. According to Nietzsche, our will to power is exposed in stories such as good versus evil are stripped away. Or is preoccupation with power based on another delus delusive story? Does power extend all the way down like turtles? Or does something else motivate that obsession? Great questions. Nietzsche believed that we have killed God. Darwinian evolution left religious morality vulnerable. It was only a matter of time until it fell victim to another story. So now we tell a story, I think a very popular story, and David Loy might be a part of this story himself, which is that the Christian religious narrative is a bad one because it was used to oppress, enslave, harm, kill, murder, justified a lot of horrible things in the history of the world. So now we got to move to Eastern religion, Buddhism, Taoism, more clean and more more clean and more um, pure forms of religion. So like I study the Beat Generation, the Beat Generation, nineteen fifty writer, nineteen fifties writers, Allen Ginsberg, uh, Jack Kerouac, um, Diane De Prima, Mary Baraka, Leroy Jones, uh, William Burroughs. There's a long list of these people. Gregory Corso, poets and writers. And they felt Buddhism fell out of the sky. They thought it was this pure and clean way to access God. Because they were, you know, they didn't like the historical narrative and context of the, that Catholicism had brought them. So they thought Buddhism was a way to access the purity of the God of um, religion that they wanted. Well, except Ginsburg was Jewish, but he um, went to India and f uh, went into all of these Eastern religions as a way to do that. Nowadays, we do this through like tarot, um, smudge sticks, all these weird TikToks I see about your tarot card reading for the day, and um, astrology, which I think Carl Sagan had a hilarious video making fun of it. Um, all of this stuff is our new spirituality, but as Kenneth Burke would say, this is debunking, which is you don't like the bad parts of this one term in your life. So you smug, but you like the good parts, so you smuggle the good parts back in under another title. You change the wrapping and you bring it back in. And I think that might be an interesting way of thinking about, you know, what's being said here uh, in terms of, um, the openness of religious morality. We kind of want that narrative, but we don't want the historical context of Christianity or we haven't figured out a story where the historical context of Christianity is part and parcel of its um, uh, appropriateness or power or good or some kind. And people are struggling with that, I'd say right now. Interesting thing to think about. Okay, let's, let's go down here and find another one of these um, interesting longer quotes. Power is one of the oldest philosophical problems because it challenges the rule of reason. Oh. But, I mean, isn't that, isn't that a story, though, Mr. Loy? In Plato's Republic, Thrasymachus, a famous sophist who was an expert in justice, argues that justice is really nothing but power. Actually, he doesn't say that. He said justice is what the stronger wants. So justice is determined by powerful people. It's not, it's not nothing but power. It's, it's the ability to decide what justice is. There's nothing governing it other than who's in charge is kind of what he says. Justice is what the strong do. Their will becomes the law. 
Might makes right, the weak can form because they must. Socrates replies, if the weak can bond together to stop a tyrant, then they are the strong. This silences Thrasymachus, but Glaucon wants proof that it is better to be just than unjust, that the just man is happy and the unjust man happy. Because one of the things Socrates always said is that um, the unjust man is always unhappy, even if they have all the riches, all the power, all the women, all the political authority, whatever. That person would be unhappy. And a lot of people thought, that's nonsense. If I had a billion dollars, or if I had a billion drachma, and I had a very, very, very attractive celebrity partner, and I got to live in the nicest house in Athens, I got to eat the finest food, I'd be super happy. Super happy. How could you say that? Well, he says, there's this famous analogy between harmony and the soul and then the state. One's life is harmonious and happy when reason rules, desires, and emotions. A state is harmonious and just when philosopher kings rule merchants and warriors. So that's the republic, which is, here's the perfect government to keep in balance the worst part of our desires. And it's certainly not democracy. It's a authoritarian state with a king who you don't have any choice of who the king is. They're a king because they've demonstrated that they can think better than you. Today we are critical of Plato's authoritarianism, dubious about a hierarchy that enthrones reason over other faculties. But is it reason, or is it the person who appears to be reasonable? For Plato, he said, no, they're actually the most reasonable person. But how would you know that? Well, he says they're trained from youth. They're trained from a young age to do these kind of things. His insight remains important. Craving for power reveals a defect in the soul. Then it goes to Christianity. If the devil is power, what is God? Interesting. Then we get into the Buddhist story. A sage told Siddhartha, Siddhartha Buddha is the, what we call the historical Buddha, the one who started the whole thing. Even though in Buddhism, everybody has a Buddha inside them and everybody is just waiting to be enlightened and move on to nirvana and all that stuff. The sage told Siddhartha's father that his son would become either a world-conquering king or a world-renouncing Buddha. His father did everything possible to insulate him from awareness of illness, old age, and death. And when Siddhartha eventually encountered them, he was so shocked that he renounced his patrimony and disappeared into the forest. According to his legend, he too rejected the worldly power that was offered to him. Both Jesus and the Buddha established communities that were physically powerless and dependent on the goodwill of others. Yeah, they had to beg and they had to rely on charity. Uh, that's what Buddha and his disciples did, just like um, Jesus and his disciples um, dealt with, uh, they depended on charity as well. What we're both saying, let go of your fears about yourself or do your best spreading the word and have faith that you'll be taken care of. You know, earlier he was talking about propaganda. You know, the root of propaganda is a propagare. I think I'm pronouncing that right, which is like to propagate, like farming, like um, uh, spreading seeds, distributing seeds for uh, agricultural purposes. So propaganda is literally kind of like the, it's almost like broadcasting. You know, we say broadcast farming. That's almost like broadcasting. Like I'm doing broadcasting now. I'm throwing this out onto the internet. And if it hits someplace where it might grow, like you're watching this and you're getting something out of it, good. But there's a lot of places where, this information is going to hit where it's not going to grow. That's fine. That's just part of how it works. But propaganda is the idea of propagation. I'm getting that. I'm getting my idea out there as broadly and, and uh, bigly as possible. And yes, I did use the word bigly there. I think we can use that. We can reappropriate that word from Trump, right? Even if you're a liberal and you hate hearing it, we can we can use that word and make it our own, right? Please don't cancel me. Let go of your fears about yourself and do your best spreading the word and have faith that you'll be taken care of. Open up and focus on giving to the world rather than taking from it, trusting in it rather than trying to protect yourself from it. That's a hard story to do, huh? Because like, uh, like I say, have an open mind, but don't let, you know, if you have too open of a mind, anybody will throw a bunch of trash into it. So you have to be very, very careful. You don't just want an open bin of a mind and accept everything that comes your way. That's not what being a critical thinker is. A critical thinker is uh, listening, but not accepting. Like, okay, I'm listening to you so I can see if I need to accept this or if it's beneficial to me accept this. Or if this, this story that you're pushing is something that I absolutely have to believe. All right, the next section is called The Big Stories, but I think I might end the video there because it's about 30 minutes. And I don't really want to do a video that's really over 30 minutes. That way you could, like, watch it, take a break, and you don't have to come back to, like, some two-hour video and be really bored. And that way it breaks it up for you. But uh, let me know what you thought about uh, this part of David Lloyd. We got about 30% of the book left, so the next one might be the last video. We'll see. Uh, this is video three. 
of David Loy's uh, The World Was Made of Stories from my public speaking class at St. John's University in lovely, livable Jamaica, Queens. Oh, wait, that's the wrong, that's the wrong music. Where is my music? There we go. That's the right music. I, you know, the last, the medieval music I used last time, I have a license for that and everything, but the, the copyright holder was like, no, you can't use it. So we're not using that music anymore. Bone Riders, gone forever, because I don't want to deal with that garbage when I buy, bought a license and they can't be bothered to look it up. So, you know, uh, neosounds.com, done with you. Bone Riders, done with you. Not going to use that anymore. I'll use this nice song that I have a license for, and uh, I use them all my videos. Never had a problem, so I kind of wasted my money at neosounds.com, but that's okay. Um, it was years ago I bought Bone Riders. Uh, the song is kind of cool. It's very medieval and very like Game of Thronesy, but maybe this is a more appropriate tune. You can weigh in on all of this on Discord. Discord where all the ideas come to be talked about. Please join and talk with us about this video, any other video, and uh, I will see you on the next one, which will be David Loy part four, where we finish the book. So you guys have a great day.